information because this is a lot of slides and pictures and videos in about 30 minutes. So I'm going to talk about how to save the planet at 400 kilometers per hour. So the way I am saving the planet is that I have a pretty cool hobby. So my hobby is that I go insanely fast in a straight line, perfectly straight line, across the salt flats to set world records. So I do that in this vehicle. Uh, it looks like a rocket, but it's actually a motorcycle. It's under international competition rules, it's a motorcycle because it only has three wheels. So the definition of a motorcycle is it has three, two, or one wheel. A car has four or more wheels. So therefore, this is a motorcycle. And to be exact, it's a battery-powered motorcycle and the world's fastest battery power or electric motorcycle. So you may wonder, how on earth is this saving the planet? Racing sounds awfully wasteful. I built this whole vehicle just to go for a straight line for a few kilometers and set the speed record. That's all I do once a year. So I will get to the saving the planet in a moment. But a little bit of background. So Bill here is my husband since many years, like a decade and a half. Um, and about 10 years ago, we decided, why don't we build the world's fastest electric motorcycle? That sounds like fun. We really wanted to build the, the world's fastest electric car, but that was too expensive, so we settled for a motorcycle. Uh, we were quite naive. We thought it would take us six months and cost about $10,000. And now it is uh, 11 years and probably $200,000. We've never counted because we don't want to know. <laughs> but 10 years ago, I was in engineering graduate school and collected an engineering uh, graduate stipend, which is a few dollars a month. And uh, you know when you are in engineering school or any kind of demanding degree program, medical school or, or uh, any of the other uh, tough professions, you have so much time and money to spare that you really need, need a really solid hobby project, right? Yeah, of course not. You have no life. You study, that's all you do when you're in engineering school. Uh, but the reality is if you take an hour between your physics homework and your math assignments, and you work on a project, and you do that every day, you get a lot of stuff done in the end. And that's how I did this project. Then I was lucky enough that Bill, who's an engineer, uh, collected a, a reasonably good engineering salary. So together with my stipend and fairly low living costs in general, we had a bit more wiggle room than the normal household. So we decided, let's build this motorcycle. It sounds like fun. So, um, Despite um, both being engineers, this was still a major undertaking. I mean, we were venturing into to territory we didn't know that much about. I mean, we've been into electric vehicles since long before it was cool. I mean, we predate, we predate Elon Musk. Bill has driven electric cars since 1995 or even, yeah, even further. He doesn't want me to date him. So, <laughs> but this project was so big. So another alternative title for today would be how to run a large project on a shoestring budget, because that is really what this was all about. All right, so saving the planet is what I was gonna talk about. So let's get into that, how this connects to saving the planet. So every major project starts with a dream. In my case, the dream was not about going fast, believe it or not, the dream was to promote electric vehicles. So I love electric vehicles. I drive a Nissan Leaf, it's the best car I've ever had. Zipping around Auckland cost me almost nothing in fuel. But at this time, electric vehicles had a really dull image. You have to think, this is time before Tesla. No one, Tesla didn't exist at this time. Uh, and electric cars were something that was boring. And if you drove an electric car, you would definitely go home alone from the party. There was just no way anyone would follow you home. So we wanted to change that image of electric vehicles because we realized electric vehicles are really the best solution for the environment. But if no one buys them because they're uncool, then it won't matter. So the goal was to build an electric vehicle that was so insanely fast that it made headlines and made people interested in electric vehicles. And also buying a car is not a rational decision. We want to believe it is. We think we're so clever when we buy a car, it isn't. It's all about the motion. So this vehicle, of course, had to be sexy. Yeah, that's me, I scrub up pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> we may want to turn down the lights a little bit. Uh, I don't know if that will make the picture a little bit better. Um, that is not my normal workshop I've, shop I've fit. So I came up with my own name for what I was doing. 
So I call this eco-activism in disguise. So I really admire the Greenpeace activists. They're super brave, they're boarding whale hunting vessels, climbing nuclear power plants, doing a great job, but I didn't like the prospect of being arrested. That just wasn't my cup of tea. So this was my way of getting people interested in environmental questions without them maybe even noticing that they did. And at 434 kilometers per hour, I get people's attention. And that was the whole point with this project. So how do you make a plan like this become reality? Well, you start with a team. I got the best team. I get Bill. He, we are peas in a pod, joined at the hip, whatever you want to call it. We call it two bodies and one brain. And we, do, we talk about engineering in bed. That's how bad it is. Bill says I, I, I talk nerdy to him. We got married in an electric delivery truck prototype, was our chapel. And we, I, I'm not kidding you, we were pronounced anode and cathode made the sparks fly. <laughs> and it goes on, it's even worse. We have non-conductive wedding bands. I got a pink, it's ceramic, the same stuff you make sushi knife out of, and Bill has a matching black. So you don't have to take them off when you work on electric stuff. That's how nerdy we are. But the two of us was, wouldn't be enough to make uh, a, such a big vehicle or run a racing program like that. I've also had another about 25 volunteers over the years, too many to mention here. But these five, or four plus Bill and me, were the people that I convinced uh, to, to uh, come to the outbacks of Australia on their own expense, I may add, to help us set a, a record in 2019. So you also need a headquarters. So this is Colorado, uh, our two-car garage. So my funny accent comes from living in uh, several different countries. I was born in Sweden, moved to the US about 14 years ago for love, married Bill. Uh, lived there for 10 years and then came here about three and a half years ago. So the kilojoule was built in Colorado. It's also exactly five and a half meters long, this vehicle, because it was the biggest that would fit in our garage. So that's the headquarters. So let's uh, cover about 10 years in at breakneck speed here. So in 2009, we thought, let's build this world's fastest electric motorcycle. Sounds like fun. I think this is the equivalent of an ultrasound sonogram for a, uh, a race vehicle. It's the very, very first CAD rendering we put together. The final thing ended up looking quite differently, but this is where it started. Then I needed wheels and brakes. These are expensive parts. And I just looked at Craigslist, that's the equivalent of trade me concluded it was much cheaper to buy a whole motorcycle than to buy these parts. I bought this motorcycle for $750. The seller asked me if I want to take it for spin. I said, you don't even bother starting it because I just need the wheels and the brakes from it. So we actually never started it. Supposedly it runs, I don't know. We gave away the parts we didn't, didn't use to someone else. So this was 2010 and it was spring break in Colorado, so uh, about February. And I called up my friends and said, we're building the world's fastest electric motorcycle. You should come and help us. It will be fun. Particularly, this is clay, uh, when Colorado looks like this in March. <laughs> and clay drove all the way from California up to Colorado, which takes at least a day to help out. We spent the week machining, um, welding, fabricating, grinding. And a week later, we thought we had built a streamliner motorcycle. We're done. See, we have a chassis. And I took it for my first test ride. Of course, we weren't like even 5% done, but it felt, felt like we were really done. So then I needed body work. Didn't have the money to spend on $50,000 carbon fiber composites body work. So I got a Pilates ball, an exercise ball, and I made my own body work. <laughs> then I ran out of volunteers, but luckily my mom came to visit, so I put her to work. In August, so this is August 2010, it's about, uh, what is that, five months after we really started. The battery went in, starting to look like a, a, like a vehicle. It's one month left to our date, our scheduled date to be on the racetrack. September 2010, two weeks left to go, we took it for first spin. So the Kilaju was born as a two-wheeled motorcycle, because at this time I didn't know a motorcycle actually could have three wheels. So it has two wheels and has these little landing gears. I flip the switch and they come down, they're pneumatically activated, so we compress the air. And I'm um, supposed to keep me like training wheels at low speed and then I get up to speed, I get balanced and I pull them up. That's the theory. 
The reality was there was no hope I could drive this one. We don't know, the jury's still out. If I couldn't drive it, we couldn't be driven. The problem was we built it so tight that I could barely fit. And I'm five foot tall, 158 centimeters. We couldn't find a smaller rider. They just there weren't any. So anyway, it was two weeks to the race. We were going to go because we are no quitters. But that kind of summarizes my feeling like this is no way we can get this done. But Bill said, there's no, no time to quit. We're going to go to this race. And at this time, we didn't even have body work done. I had done my hideous Pilatus ball composites, and everything else was missing. And there was four days left to technical inspection. And Bill said, we're going to go. Here, take this piece of sheet metal, bend it over your knee. We're going to build body work. So we did. We built. And one day later than we should have left, we left. And we got to Bonneville got through technical inspection, which is a big deal. There are lots of safety requirements for a vehicle like this. But as I suspected, I couldn't get it up to balancing from these little landing gears. It was just riding like a three-year-old on the, trying to learn how to ride a bicycle. And that was it. But we went back, back home. And one important thing I learned going to Bonneville was that the motorcycle is allowed to have three wheels. Could be a sidecar motorcycle. He went home, built the sidecar, came back the next year and set our first world record. We were super excited that we went 222 kilometers per hour. We thought that was really fast. We did blow up four motors doing it, so you can't blame me for not trying. And then we came back uh, year after year, got to almost 200 miles per hour, which was a big target. Took us a couple of years to get to that few world records along the way, and a Guinness World Record book. Um, my most important record, which actually meant most to me, and one of the best selfies I have ever taken in my life, was that when I finally set the record over 400 kilometers per hour. And the all-time best with a kilojoule was 434. So let's take a look and see what it looks like running for records like this at a salt flat. So I have a video, it's about a minute and a half, uh, and it basically summarizes about seven years of work. So these are the, um, the legendary, famous Bonneville salt flats in the US, um, Utah, US. Uh, these days, living in New Zealand, by the way, Bill and I are so thankful that we're living in New Zealand. And um, so thank you for letting us in and letting us work here, live here. Uh, this is the best place in the world. No joke. Um, we're loving it, and we're just really loving the interest in the electric vehicles, environment, and all of that. But that was a bit of a side note. Um, because we're living in New Zealand, our new home ven uh, venue for racing is the Salt Flats in Australia. So that's where we, we're trying to get. I'll get to that in a moment. So, but the big question is, okay, did I save the planet? So I claimed on my title slide that I'm saving the planet. Well. The whole purpose of the kilojoule was to get people's attention and he get headlines and um, just bring an interest in electric vehicles. And the fact that I'm here today tells me that I've been successful to some extent at least. And also I wanted headlines and I got quite a few of those. 
over the years. So I'm hoping that I have done something and gotten a few more people to drive electric cars. So I like to summarize just a kind of a few words of, of wisdom that I, I kind of found somewhere and stole from someone. I've never really found the, uh, the source. So um, the first thing is, if you want to accomplish a big project like this, and it kind of ties in with my second title, how to run a big project on a shoestring budget, you need to dream big. You can, there's no limit, size limit to your dreams. You can dream as big as you want. And you need to dream big because you can never really accomplish everything you dream of. Then you have to set the realistic goal. So in our case, we went for a motorcycle instead of a car because it was a more realistic goal to take the overall motorcycle record rather than the overall electric car record. And then you had, have to have a date. So for us, it was September 2010. If we hadn't had that date, we would probably still be working away and never got to the track because you're never done and never really feel finished enough. But when you have a date, you just have to get it done. Then you have to make a slightly pessimistic plan to, um, um, because no matter how pessimistic plan you make, you're always just gonna run out of time and money long before you're done. So, but you need to plan and it has to be a little bit pessimistic. And then you have to get into action and you cannot give up. And that's how something becomes reality. So I have a rule, I work on this project at least five minutes every day. And you may say there's no way on earth that you're gonna build a motorcycle working five minutes a day. And that's correct. Five minutes a day won't get you far, but five minutes a day will get you started. And some days you will only work five minutes. You're gonna look up a component, write that email, uh, do some sort of search, uh, find a book, or just drill a hole in a piece of metal. And your five minutes are done and you feel, no, I don't wanna do this today. But typically your five minutes turns into two hours or five hours and you realize you've forgotten to eat dinner and it's one o'clock at night because you got carried away working. And that's how you get things done. And um, I, I get kind of annoyed at inspirational speakers. They always talk about the power of your thoughts and the power of your dreams. And I always say, your thoughts have no power. Your only your actions do. You can sit home, watch Instagram, dream as much as you want, but if you never take that step and get into action, you will never get where you want to go. Oh well, so that was the current, or the, the first dream. We reached the goal, we built the world's fastest electric motorcycle. But there's always a new dream. Just because you fill a goal, meet, reach a goal, doesn't mean you stop dreaming. So the new dream is to build the world's fastest motorcycle, full stop, not just electric. So the Killer Jewel is the world's 11th fastest motorcycle. But I want it to be number one. So in July 2019, my new dream, the Green Envy, looked like a pile of steel tubing like this. Six months and 21 days later, the Green Envy was ready to be shipped to Australia, to the Salt Flats, to be raced. The, the Green Envy has a 1,000 horsepower, it's all electric, and it's built for 650 kilometers per hour because that's what I need to take the motorcycle record. We all know what happened in February, March 2020, when the world came to a screeching halt. Bill and I were in Australia, we were just about to leave Adelaide and go to the Salt Flats, and the event was canceled, the world was closing down. We headed back to Auckland just in time for the lockdown. Um, so our goal of becoming the world's fastest, electric, uh, fastest motorcycle was postponed a year. Uh, come March 2021, the Green Envy was in Australia, we were in Auckland ready to go, and the three week Auckland lockdown happened just during race week. So we never got out of the country. So I'm trying to bring the bike back. Uh, so now it is March 2020 will be the debut instead. So it is what it is. This is typical when you run big projects, you get the two year delay, you just live with it, you roll with the punches and you do something else um, when you have time to spare. And of course the goal with, electric, uh, with the Green Envy is to show that electric vehicles 
aren't slow or boring. So still the same goal, saving the planet by promoting electric vehicles. So everybody loves numbers. We always talk about numbers, uh, acceleration, fuel economy, range, and so on. So I just, uh, just want to give a few numbers about the green envy before I go into my next part of my presentations, which is more of ruthless self-promotion. But I think you will like it because it's a pretty cool story as well. So zero to 100 kilometers per hour for the green envy is not that impressive. It will take about eight seconds. Zero to uh, 650 kilometers per hour will take me about 59 seconds. So that's maybe not mind blowing, but that is kind of similar to an airplane accelerating and taking off. So it doesn't have any gear. So it's just this constant slow acceleration. And acceleration needs to be pretty slow because the salt surface is slippery. It's almost like snow, which you wouldn't know much about here, this end of the country, uh, but like a dirt road. This is, the climate here is so nice. So I spent 28 years in Sweden, freezing my behind off. Moved to Colorado, which has kind of colder winters, but hotter summers and a whole much drier climate. And that was nice. And we come here and we're just loving it. So I haven't used my winter coat for four years, I think. Anyway, uh, that was uh, digressing a bit. So the battery pack in the green envy holds about 20 kilowatt hours. That equivalent energy wise to about 2.2 liters of petrol. So that's what it will take. I would use up pretty much all of that to make a record run where I have about four miles, so about six kilometers to get up to speed. Then my speed is measured over one mile. The average of that will be my record speed. Or uh, if I, ex actually, let me put it this way. I have pretty much all the space I want to accelerate, but it's typically given about four miles by the organizers when they lay out the track. Uh, where one, and a half, one, kilo, uh, one mile, my speed is measured. The average of that speed becomes my record qualifier speed. And if that speed exceeds the previous record, I have qualified for a new record. But I have to do it again to get the record. So depending on which event you are at, you either have to do it within two hours or the same day or the same week. You have to do the same speed again or faster. If that average speed also no, the average of the two average speeds exceeds the old record, then you get the new record. It's technicalities, lots of technicalities, uh, like with every competition. Anyway, uh, making a run like that will take all of my 20 kilowatt hours approximately. But if I were to cruise on a highway at about 100K, which I can't because the vehicle is in the street legal, but if it was, I could drive about 600 kilometers on one uh, on one battery charge. And if I were to translate this into the government's um, fuel economy labeling system, I would certainly get a whole lot more than six stars. I would get like 60 or 100 stars. And it would be about 0 0.37 liters per 100 kilometers or 10 times less than a Prius in fuel economy. So you can see that electric vehicles can both be insanely fast and incredibly efficient and this is really how it all ties together why electric vehicles are great for the climate and the um, environment. So that was kind of the racing part, how we got into racing, what we're doing. Uh, the main thing is to promote electric vehicles. I am not making any money on racing. It keeps me poor. <laughs> so that said, I would say thank you to the organizers and the sponsors of this event for actually uh, covering my costs of getting here because the Green Envy is, a, is an expensive um, beast to feed. So um, stuck in lockdown two years in a row, but particularly stuck in lockdown last year. Bill and I found ourselves at home. Uh, I had quit my job at the University of Auckland as a lecturer in engineering design, and I figured I'm gonna take a year off, focus on racing, set some records, and when I run out of money, I will get a job. Well, what happened in 2020 is that all racing was canceled. Uh, we were in lockdown, we weren't supposed to go to the workshop. So Bill and I thought, what can we do at home? Well, you know, why don't we do something with 3D printing? So we had a change in plans. And not only want, did we want to do something with 3D printing, we said we should make this a business. 
This is the great time. What also happened during the lockdown and the following months is you could barely buy 3D printing filament. So that's a plastic string that goes into the 3D printer. If you've never seen a 3D printer, by the way, there is one working away in the back room, printing the designs the students made earlier today. Uh, so you couldn't buy 3D printing filament because shipping was interrupted and we thought we should bring manufacturing to New Zealand. Let's take this year when we can't do racing and start a manufacturing business. So we did. And um, we have been, been doing 3D printing for quite a few years. We do a lot of big things. This is the aerodynamic cowling that goes around the sidecar on the kilojoule. It was printed. Uh, it took six days to print. Weighs about 10 kilograms. It goes in like that, and then there's just sheet metal that goes on top. This little modification, because 3D printing allows you to print any shape you want. While you build something out of metal, it's much harder. Changing this from just a simple metal shape to a correct aerodynamic 3D printed shape decreased the whole vehicle's energy consumption with 33% of speed. And that was really just thanks to the 3D printing allowing us to make this shape. But when you print big things, you need big spools of filament. Big spools of filament are very difficult to get to New Zealand because no one imports them because basically no one uses them, them except us. So we thought we should make a machine, let's build and design a machine that makes 3D printing filament. So we started out small, uh, something we could do at home and not in a workshop. So we went online, found an open source 3D printing filament desktop sized machine. It's sitting here in the background, you can't really see it. But it's this thing, it sucks in plastic pellets through this old Sprite bottle, melts it, and then it makes 3D printed filament and spools it up. And almost the whole thing is 3D printed, except the parts that have to be metal. And we were so proud, we made a spool of filament in like a day. Um, but then we worked away on this, and sometimes the planets just line up in the universe. And this was this once in a lifetime offer of buying a machine. So it turns out, uh, if you've ever been to McDonald's, KFC or Burger King and you had a single-use plastic drinking straw. That drinking straw was made in New Zealand and it was made in the machine you can see in the background behind us here. But McDonald's and most, uh, many of the fast food chains are either going to uh, paper straws or they go to bioplastic straws. So there wasn't really any need for manufacturing in New Zealand and the company or the owner of the company decided to retire, sell off his drinking straw machines, the only two that existed in New Zealand, and we got the chance to buy one of them. And if you have never seen drinking straws made, I'll show you a video. It's, I had no clue how drinking straws are made. There's just absolutely no idea. But drinking straws are made very similar to fr fr printing filament or plastic string, weed whacker spring, string, they're all made the same way. And this is how you make drinking straws. Eight hundred of them per minute. So the water bath is to cool down the plastic. So you have plastics being melted, pushed out through a special tool head, and then chopped to little pieces. So that's the plastic that goes into your drinking straws. So you can see, if you can make a tube that has a hole in the inside, you can basically make a tube that doesn't have a hole in the inside, which is a 3D printing filament. What, when, can you grab a spool, Bill? The one in the box, and I will just show it. It's on top of the cabinet there. So we bought this machine, it was going to go, uh, if we hadn't bought it, it would probably have gone on the scrap yard and been melted down and become refrigerators. So just to make sure we know, we. we know what we're talking about. So what goes into a 3D printer is a plastic string like this. It's basically ink for your 3D printer. So the printer melts it down and then puts it out with a basically a robotic arm and you can make all kinds of things from motorcycle parts to handbags and everything in between. So we bought this machine uh, you can see it's about 10 meters long. 
and we had to bring it home. So luckily it was in Auckland, but on the wrong side of town. So we took it apart, got it ready for um, a shipment home. And also two weeks before, Bill had had open heart surgery and got a new heart valve. So he was a bit weak. Yeah, so I tried to do most of the heavy lifting. So we packed it up, got it ready for shipment back home to our own workshop. There it came on a high ebb. So the main extruder body weighs about two tons. It's a bit oh, maybe overkill for what we're doing for, but a great machine. And also we love that it was used. And we love the fact that we took a machine that used to make drinking straws that got stuck in turtles' noses and turn it into making a filament that is currently we're making it from bioplastics. Next step is to use recycled plastics. Uh, I love this photo and I, uh, I have never seen Bill before or after with a smile that big. <laughs> so here is the, we had to remove this big tool head that made this, the drinking straw. By the way, the red stripe on the drinking straw is not paint, it's actually red plastics. It's part of the plastics and it comes to, uh, through two other extruder screws to make the stripes. Cleaning out the old stuff and then six months later, Okay, I'll just warn you, my workshop is not as neat as this drinking straw manufacturer workshop. But six months later, the machine is now making 3D printing filament in Auckland, in New Zealand. So we don't have to import all the stuff we need. So the string comes out, it's melted, it cools in a water bath, then it gets measured to axis laser measurement. So a 3D printing filament typically is 1.75 millimeters in diameter and it's allowed to vary 50 microns, so it's allowed to be 1.7 to 1.8, but preferably it should be even tighter in tolerance. So uh, making filament was kind of a technical challenge, but uh, it, it, it was possible with hard work for about six months, but making a filament isn't the only part, you also have to sell it, and to sell it, you need to spool it up on spools, of course. So normally 3D printing filament is sold on injection molded plastic spools that weigh about 300 gram. It's crazy to buy a kilogram of plastics and then have 300, kilo, 300 grams of plastic spool that you just throw away. So I wanted them to be paper, paper spools. Uh, I couldn't really find a manufacturer for that. So I had to figure it out myself. I did prototyping, laser cutting, even 3D printed parts to cut other parts and then finally uh, got all the pieces together with, with several contractors and made New Zealand made paper spools for our New Zealand made filament. And that's the finished product. So what was surprising to me and pleasantly surprising is that running a, a startup business is actually not different than running a racing team. You basically have to do everything yourself. You figure it out, you have no budget and things just have to get, things just have to get done. So this is the ruthless part of self-promotion today. We do have a range of 3D printing filament. These are all made from sugar cane bioplastics. And uh, our local store stocked them. That was a very proud moment. And now there are several retailers and more to come. So what do you do when you are a 3D pro uh, printing filament manufacturer? Well, you end up with spools of stuff that didn't come out so well. It's kind of okay, but isn't really good enough for selling. Well can print yourself. <laughs> so I decided, let me use up all these spools, these half full spools of filament and print myself. So it's over there by the, uh, the door if you want to see me. So that is, I was, uh, I actually 3D scanned myself using an online app and an Xbox camera. I scanned myself and then I printed myself in pieces. That weighs about 30 kilograms or so. Took about 300 hours or two weeks to print. So I've always wanted a mannequin based on myself, so I got it. <laughs> Don't think that really is saving the planet, but it really is, is, is showing off the technology. So saving the planet was the overall title, and this is my last video. Uh, it was really cut for Instagram and not for big screen, but it's kind of fun anyway. Um, so one of the questions I get and the criticism that I get is like, hey, you ought to save the planet, but you're a plastics manufacturer. Aren't you the plastics problem? Absolutely. I am part of the plastics problem, but I don't want to be part of the plastics problem. 
So the vision I have for New Zealand, and this is a, New Zealand is a perfect place for this. So we have an increasing number of 3D printers. The schools get 3D printers. Um, kids get 3D printers. Businesses get 3D printers to prototype things. A lot of the prints are only used once or they fail. Could be that the power went out in the middle of the night or you printed the wrong file or it didn't fit. So you end up with these discarded prints. Well, those discarded prints contain really qu good quality plastics. And we can melt that many times before it degrades. Just like we can buy milk bottles now that open recycled plastics, we can take 3D prints, recycle them and make new 3D printing filaments. If there's any economy in this yet, I don't know. That's probably where the big challenge will be. Just like money is the big, big challenge to running a racing program, money is the big challenge in recycling. Anyway, what we want to do is to close the loop on 3D printing materials. So you send back the stuff you don't want anymore and we turn it into new filaments. And the more we can do that, the less stuff we have to import. Because the plastics is imported uh, the plastics we use come from Thailand and it's made from sugar cane. So this is what you do with your prints that didn't come out right. Oh, can you grab my shoes? So this is, of course, a little a lab scale shredder, but the principle is the same even if you go for, for big... Uh, or small. So these are all stuff that didn't come out right. And when you have a 3D printer, you end up with a lot of these. So we didn't sort it for colors. We didn't bother for this first, first test. But of course, you can sort the colors and keep the colors clean throughout the recycling. Same machine, just using recycled material instead. Came out equally good. But the color is a bit funky, of course, because we didn't sort anything. So has anyone seen the Flexi Rex before, the popular print? So this is probably one of the world's most printed items. So it's a little T-Rex. And you print it as in one go, and it has joints. This one got a little bit too uh, unflexible, but it is. I have some better ones on display here. So there is my little Rex, and this is all made from recycled 3D prints making new prints. Um, so the first red piece that was shredded in my shredder was actually a failed shoe. So another thing you can do with a 3D printer, you can print shoes. <laughs> and I'll, I'll send these around. Uh, the upper part, the rubber is also 3D printed and the sole is 3D printed because you can 3D print rubber even if it's a bit unusual. And yes, I can wear them. Yes, they fit, they're built to, to fit me. They are about as comfortable as six inch heels or platforms will ever get. So, but I had several failed prints or when I made these shoes, I printed probably about five versions before I got it right. And that would be a perfect thing to just recycle and make new filament. So that's about the end of my presentation. Yeah. You can see my life is all about engineering and that's why I get invited to fun places like here and teach students how to engineer things and uh, get them inspired with STEM. So, so to all the students here, I just want to tell you that if you pursue anything in STEM, science or engineering, you have a great possible career ahead of you. So STEM is, is great because you have high paid jobs, you're well respected and you basically, if you pick the right job, you spend the entire life playing with things and you get paid for it. So the only thing you have to do though, you have to do your maths homework. So the key to be good in STEM is to be strong in maths. You don't have to like math, I don't like math, but you have to do it and you need to be good at it because you're good at it and you just sail right through whatever degree program you want to go into. So I think that's it and I'm happy to take whatever questions there are. <laughs>